Judy, do you want to call the roll? Yes, Housh. Here. There she is, McQueen. Here. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Yes. Thank you, Curlis. Yes. Thank you. Also present are Public Works Director Johnny Burns, uh, Village Manager Jose Ramon, Finance Director Matt Dillon, and I think that's it. Is, is Brianne on this meeting, Josue? She may, she may hop in. She's not uh, in the meeting. There's okay. A, an item for her to cover. But Thank if we, you. But if we need, need her, she's, uh, she's available. She's accessible, so I can call her. Text. Okay. So, okay. Josue, are you kicking this off? Or? Yes, we are. Right. So, um, before kicking this meeting, well, as part of kicking the meeting off, I want to know, uh, ask you, the council members, do you have any questions about the organizational chart and the personnel allocation? Because, you know, for for the special revenue uh, and enterprise funds, that's a lot of the cost driver, with the exception of the electric fund, where the single largest expense is the cost of power. So any questions on personnel uh, or organizational chart? Um, I, I don't have specific questions, except <clears throat> when we get to places where, you know, uh, there was only one place I think that I saw where the personnel expense seemed to have shifted. And I'm assuming that that also has to do with how Josue, you and maybe other people have been uh, designating their time. So if there's some kind of thing that looks like it's different than it was last year or the last two years, then I think it's worth just mentioning. But I had, I don't have it in front of me now uh, because I'm looking at you, but I, I had no real questions about any of it. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, okay. I have something. This okay. is Lisa. So um, I, I, I thought that I understood that there's going to be some personnel changes among the PD. And I was wondering if there was going to be any reallocation of some of the, those positions to um, be towards more um, social services outreach kind of headcount. Uh, I'm sorry, Lisa, I, I, if I missed something, um, you're saying we're changing the headcount in the police department? Well, I thought I had understood that there were some changes that were anticipated just organically next year, maybe due to a retirement or something like that, or someone who had been part-time maybe wasn't going to be anymore, or maybe I'm recalling this incorrectly, but I thought there were going to be some changes that were anticipated and if in that case those roles would be reallocated somehow uh, away from peace officers and towards uh, more social service type roles like you know more like Florence's role uh, I can get into some of that uh, in, a, in a limited in a limited matter um, and I say limited matter because they are I have to tread carefully when we talk about Individuals that may be looking at retirement and whatnot. I don't want there to be a perception of anybody getting pushed out. Um, and oh whatnot. no, it's not that. I, absolutely not that. So what I what I can tell you now is what we've done so far in relations to that, and this is you know we're we're, we're talking about the general fund uh, at this point, since that's where the public safety uh, expenses are are allocated. When we when we were looking to create a full-time position for the social work position for the community outreach specialist, we were, we were sensitive to adding additional overhead to the police department. So we, we timed it and we, there was one position that a person that was transitioning out in, from that part-time role. And what we did with that part-time role, we re, re, reorganized that work. Uh, so we had an individual doing data reporting and a lot of the data work within the police department. And as that person left, well, we reorganized their work. We had uh, dispatchers and a few others pick up that function. And that's how we were able to create the full-time position for Florence Randolph, the community outreach specialist, 
uh, as a full-time position without adding an additional headcount. We just absorb that part-time role and make two part-time roles into, into one full-time. Could we have an opportunity in 2021 where we have some changes in personnel, we are going to be looking at what we can do to better deliver on the services we've said we want to deliver, which are some of those outside of the traditional law enforcement roles, uh, be able to do more community outreach uh, specialist type of uh, function. So there isn't there. Thank I don't, you. I don't have a specific <laughs> plan right now because I don't have a letter from officers retiring or uh, someone who's indicated that they are their last day is in the foreseeable future. Yeah, understood. I, you know, I just, you know, we were started to talk about the police budget in the last meeting, and it's just been on my mind ever since. And, you know, that's why I'm asking. Thank and, you. Okay, thank you. Josue, I misunderstood your original question. I thought you were asking about personnel within the special enterprise funds. And I, I do have a number of questions about the YSPD, which I started to ask a few and I was not satisfied with the answers from last time, but I don't, but I also, Brian, it seemed like Brian had some similar issues and I don't wanna do it now in this context because I think it goes deeper than we can do right now, but I do plan on you, you, are, you are right in, in my question. My question related to personnel allocations as it relates to special uh, revenue funds. So because a lot of that personnel expense is allocated across these departments and some of those staff are shared across uh, the department. So an example would be our streets crews or also our parks and recreation crews. So Tanner Busi and, <coughs> and the, the other folks. So, uh, Marianne, you, you, you're right. My question was related. How do personnel charges relate to the special revenue fund? Okay. So I, I apologize. And that was my confusion. And I just had all personnel in my head and I wasn't focused in yet on just enterprise funds. So sorry to take us in a direction we weren't going right then. Good. good. I think they're valid questions and you know, we'll, we'll hope to get through them and uh, through this budgeting process. All right, so I am going to share my screen and you should be looking at, you should see the special revenue uh, funds. So what's different in, in how this, these uh, funds are organized is that on the upper part of the report, you see a summary view of each special revenue fund. So you'll see the revenue, the expenditure, and what is the difference and that amount. So we will we'll start with the with the top one. You see that we let me move this out of the out of here. So in the in the proposed budget, we've tried uh, trimming the expenses significantly as much as we could. There are there are still we're still looking at rooms of uh, opportunities to, to do additional. Um, but I think this we are presenting uh, uh, what I believe is a, a good budget um, so far. So on street maintenance and repairs, we've got a total revenue of six hundred and seventy-seven thousand six hundred dollars, with expenditures of seven hundred and eighty-four thousand two hundred nineteen. On the state highway fund, we have ten thousand eight hundred in revenue and ten thousand expenses, so we're underspending there. On parks and recreation. Uh, 534,000, sorry, 533,000 and 584 in expenditures. In the economic development fund, uh, we anticipate up to $50,000 in expenses. That's an amount that we've uh, looking to carry over, but, or in expenses that we wanna anticipate. I understand that we wanna continue to make investments in a community that are economic development investments. So there's that allocation there. The green space fund, we don't have any revenue or any expense that we anticipate for 2021. However, uh, we, we're facing a current challenge that we may, we may have an, act, actual, an activity there 
um, in 2021, but I think we can talk about that issue later, right, Brian? Yep. Okay, then we have the, the, the MBI, that's the vehicle, motor vehicle uh, license uh, permissible tax. That's a revenue line and that money gets reallocated at other departments. So no expense in that special revenue. The computer fund, uh, a thousand, the mayor's computer, core computer fund, that's something that's been going on for a while and we just keep on, it's got such a small transaction amount. Law enforcement education fund. We're reporting these because they exist in our budget and have existed for a year, but for years, but we don't have any activity in the law enforcement and education fund. Uh, so maybe at some point we make a decision about how do we continue to re report on this fund. The coats and supply fund, we, this is something that we do every year. You know, we support uh, vulnerable children that need assistance in securing boots and co co uh, coats and school supply every year. And that has a revenue stream. But a lot of those funds are, or a lot of those expenses get covered by donations that we receive as we market the activity. So you'll see this in a, in a negative, in a deficit in, uh, in operations. Uh, but that's something where we also fundraise as the activity comes up. There's a uh, state law law enforcement trust fund. We have expenditures there. We'll get into those expenditures as, as they come up. The utility round, roundup fund, we've traditionally raised this around $7,500 and we're spending around $7,500. This year, what's unique about this year is, well, we're under COVID and we've had a lot of demand for utility uh, assistance. And how we've met that demand is utilizing our community outreach specialist services and what she, what Florence has access to in terms of resources, community acts, a community action partnership uh, at the Miami Valley. They've uh, provide funding. The, um, the township contributed over $20,000 this year to assist with utility payments. And Florence has utilized all of that already. Uh, but we're pursuing funding from Governor DeWines. So all that to say is that for 2021, we've got this number factored in for right now, but it's likely to change. And it's likely to change because under COVID, we're not sure that everything will come out of it in the first quarter of 2021. So we'll continue to evaluate this and evaluate the demand for utility assistance in the coming months. And try to tap into all the resources that we can. Josue, this is Lisa. Uh, and you know, I apologize if I just am fuzzy, but it would help me if you would uh, zoom back a little to a higher level overview, because what I'm noticing is all those over unders. Uh -huh. Can you go back to that view where it was like over under and then so, to me, what this, I, please clarify, I, I'm looking for the red, red in parentheses that I was saying. Mm -hmm. Can you please clarify? Um, I believe what this means is that, that for all of these, we're under the revenue to meet the desired expenditure. Right? That's what that means, doesn't it? Correct. It does. It does. Now, one of the things to consider is that many of these funds have uh, reserves in them. So the, the negative, if we're at a negative number, as we have been for the last two years, because we've been utilizing the reserves that we have built up over the years. So a lot of, uh, a lot of our, our funds can be seen as they're losing money. But some of that is intentional because we're utilizing uh, fund reserves to make the investments in the projects that we need. Uh, so a lot of the, the over expense, if you will, is, is intentional because we've had revenue funds that we're looking to use for capital improvements and whatnot. So uh, I think some of this will come into focus, uh, Lisa, when we lo are looking at the actual expense and what's driving that that uh, 
deficit, if you will, in a particular fund? Well, thank you, because I really feel like the role of, I mean, the way I look at my role is not necessarily to, you know, look at every mathematic calculation, but to step back and kind of look at the whole picture to make decisions about right sizing of funds, to make help make decisions about risk. And, you know, I mean, I don't know if others feel that same way, but I mean, I feel like those are the conversations for, for counsel. And maybe that's a little, a, a higher level conversation than just a review of yes. field by field in an Excel. It does, it does. And, you know, I think that's where the, where the two different bodies come together to figure things out, right? The, 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 the primary role of uh, counsel when it comes to a planning document such as this is, does this document as a planning document reflect the vision and goals of counsel? And for us as the operation, well, we have to, you know, uh, mow grass, we have to clear sidewalks, clear roads, salt roads, do pothole patches. Those are operational things. Those are things that we just do every day and so from an operations perspective, this is our planning tool. And the two, both the division and the goal-oriented body and the operations body comes to a meeting point and talk about how do we deliver on both? How do we deliver, how do our planning for operations deliver the vision, mission, and goals of council? So I think that's where, where it could be a bit of a conflict because, um, the two don't translate well together, right? Like, what is the goal? What is the vision, mission, and goal of mowing grass? I, you know, we can agree that we want our parks to be beautiful and attractive because they create an atmosphere in our community that contributes to the health and well being of our community. But it, it, it can be a difficult translation at times. How do you put the value of mowing on? From an economic perspective, we can tell you exactly what how much mowing, mowing uh, grass costs us, um, but how do we measure the impact on the emotional well-being for a community and how does that translate to the vision mission of the council? So I recognize that, this, that difference. There is one thing that this brings to mind, Lisa, is um, you know, what we mean by right-sizing our budgets um, and uh, a calculation that we've you know, we often have is, um, you know, what percentage of reserve we're looking at. Um, and I think that may be part of um, what we might want to see um, with all of these funds is, you know, some idea of, you know, beyond the, like in the red, um, what ultimately we're doing to invest those funds as, as Josue talked about. Um, so I don't know what's the best way to measure that, but I, I just want to, you know, highlight that we can probably do um, a better job of drilling down on what it means to right size our funds. All right. Uh, we've talked about this for several years now, but maybe we can get a little bit more analytical about it. Uh, another thing that might be helpful rather than starting off with the financials uh, is saying like, let's take parks, um, talking about what was done during this year. For example, there was the bridge or whatever, any, any unusual thing. Are there un different things being planned for 2021? And then sort of going down into showing how it relates financially. Cause otherwise, I mean, that's sort of what I'm waiting for, frankly, what's gonna be if there are differences in numbers, what's going to be, why? What, what what is the work that's going to be done, or capital improvements, whatever? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's important to distinguish what are operational expenses and what are uh, some of these projects that you're talking about. For example, when we look at when we look at wastewater treatment services, what they do every day is treat the excrement that comes from a town, and that's day in and day out, the cost of the chemical, the cost of uh, all the stuff that's involved in there. So there isn't, for that expense, when we talk about some other expenses, there isn't anything new, there isn't necessarily a new product. So when we look at some of these expenses and, and special revenue, uh, some of that applies. You know, a lot of the road services, more, 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 
there's two types of roads, road types of expenses. We have the capital projects such as blacktopping and road resurfacing, uh, new sidewalk uh, installations. Those are projects, and, and that's to your point, Marianne, what is, what is, what is it different? What is it new that we're doing? And we talk about those things in capital, in the capital budget. What we're looking at for Parks and Rec here, this is the ongoing, the ongoing work. Um, so sign upgrades, uh, sign replacement. Johnny, these are these are sort of your departments. Do you want to weigh in? These are. <clears throat> it's for everyday uh, operations, mowing grass, um, trash pickup. You know, this this is. Uh, is nothing like Ellis Bridges and, and shelter houses and all that. So this is uh, trail maintenance, you know, mowing the trail, mowing the golf cart, taking care of the diamonds, uh, getting the different areas up and functional. Yeah, I, I, would, I would add one more thing is because Matt and I were, were talking about this. We, we were looking at restructure it, not restructuring the budget entirely, but how do we present the budget? We wanted, we're both coming from municipalities or big cities where a budget is constructed as a response to key performance indicators and uh, strategic goals and objectives. So they're, they're projects. So Lisa started talking about this, I believe two years ago about the zero based budgeting. It's what is it that you want to accomplish? And then you build the budget to that, not looking at historical numbers and just keep adjustments. Um, so we, we, we have some of that thinking here that hasn't been the practice uh, for a budget in, in the village for, I don't I, I think that what you're looking at now is, is what the budget has been for by our records on this, by what is four or five years. So, with, with Matt now at the, in the organization, we are looking at some more of that str more strategic planning as we think about our budget. And uh, Matt, I don't know if you want to weigh in, but you were looking at the uh, government accounting. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a standard um, by the, the Government Finance Officers Association, uh, just a standard template that uh, the municipalities use to, um, to strategize their budget, prepare a document which represents uh, um, numerically and, and uh, financially the views and uh, priorities of council. I think the, the numbers and just to echo what, what Jose has already said, uh, these are uh, a continuation of operational levels and, and the cost that you see to, to maintain current service levels in your town as you, as you come to expect those. So I made, and I may be misunderstanding the question, but would it be useful for a note to be out to the side because we're not yet doing capital that would indicate where the funds are anticipated to come to meet that unmet, that deficit? Um, I am hearing Lisa saying, well, I'm not sure how to be fiscally responsible uh, to a project or to this budget if I don't understand where, where the deficit's being met. I mean, I may be misinterpreting, but that's what I thought I was hearing. Well, and I have a related question, like why, why huge increases? For example, you know, if you look at parks and recreation in 2018, the revenue was 317,000 and it's ballooned to, you know, proposed 533,000. Yes, and that, that becomes comes into focus when we look at the actual the actual fund. So if we're looking at we're looking at streets, we we do have um, we do increase in personnel, and as we add wages to to those uh, to those departments in the future, we look to out we look to right size them. Here, this is the U column. So when you look at our our budget. We had initially budget in 20, 2020, this is before COVID, we had budget a uh, streets department being funded at the personnel level of 266,000. When you look at what we're proposing for, for 2021, 
that's sixty thousand dollars less. So the you have seen increases here over the years, but when you look at what we're trying to do for twenty twenty one, that's a sixty thousand uh, dollar decrease in that personnel allocation. So we are making those significant reductions in the budget, and that's we're trying to get to the right size uh, a budget while also maintaining uh, similar uh, service levels. So you are seeing those increases in those previous years, but we're trying to we're trying to we're trying to control those costs as here out here in 2021. So I, 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 you, you brought this up, Laura, for, for streets, and that's- uh, Well, parks, 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 I mean, just- so Parks, well, we, all, we look at the parks too. We're, we've been very conscious and try to, try to keep costs under control. So when you look at the cost for 2020, oh, sorry, this is our revenue services uh, and expenditures, you look at our, our parks, we're, we're limiting the, the increases in, in wages. What you see here in wages, the, the increase is actually a, a, a very close to what it was in 2019. Uh, what, the, what you see changes are that we are allocating the health insurance based on where we think the expense is, based on the personnel allocation. So you're seeing some growth in, or you're seeing in increases and these uh, fringe benefits. And a lot of that has to do with us trying to put the expense where it belongs. But in wages, actually our wages for, 20, for 2021 are gonna be lower than what they were initially projected for 2020. Um, so that's our all. But if you look at how the parks have, uh, the budget for parks has increased over the years, when you're looking at just the totals, you, it looks like a shocking increase, but when you look at where those transfer or some of those expenses are going, there, you, know, you see for 2019, we had 16,000 oh. just go into <laughs> capital expenses. Um, but this year, we've taken that out. We've taken, we've taken out a lot of those expenses. Uh, I think one thing that, that you need to realize is, is line item 204, it says park and recs, but that actually incorporates park and recs, the pool, the Bryant Center, and the youth center all at the same time. Yeah. There is four separate uh, things that are charged out of 204. There are four different departments within parks and recs, and that and they're all grouped together in the summary um, page. But Johnny's right, we've got pools, we got um, Bryant Center. The Bryan Center, what's up here? Uh, yeah. This is parks. parks. So we got parks. We and have pool. the pool and the wages Bryant associated Center. with the pool. And you look at the pool, we're controlling costs at pool. You know, we're going from 75,000 down to 60,000. And, you know, we have, not only do we have one of the only pools in the county, we have the best pool in the county. I, so I, I think that some of the added increase that you see, Laura, is when they, bring it out of the general fund, it has to be allocated. And we did some major capital improvements that would have got taken out of there as well. Mm -hmm. So here you see some increases when you talk about uh, why are some of these increases for this year? We've got painting of the pool that needs to happen. We have uh, the, the, the painting of the pool is not just an aesthetics, it actually seals the pool. It keeps leaks from happening into, into right. the soil, which can cause erosion. Um, it creates all kinds of issues. Uh, Judy was on me for several days during the summer because the pool was cloudy and Johnny was troubleshooting and it was it was a big leak that um, happened underneath the pool. And that's why we got 25,000 in there in capital. We need to fix that leak and we need to paint the entire pool. And we also have some trip hazards um, in the pool. So what's driving that increase in the, in the, in the pool? Well, there's 35,000 right there in capital that we need to, that we need to budget for. Um, there's also the John Bryan Center is in that, in that parks al allocation. One of the, and, oh, you, you do see costs increasing at the, at the Bryan Center, um, but the Bryan Center is providing a lot of services. We were running a program almost every day throughout the year. When you look at what we're doing now, we're running 
a learning center now at the at the at the John Bryan Center from eight eight eight. What time do the kids start, uh, Johnny? Eight o'clock in the morning. They they start eight o'clock in the morning. They start eight o'clock in the morning and they're here until seven o'clock. Seven or eight o'clock. So and that requires requires staff and then other resources. So um, one of the things I'm I when I think about these recreational activities. And I had an internal conflict here in the organization because you know, we're classifying uh, certain activities, whether they were mandated or essential services. And if you recall, I took a lot of heat for opening the pool. The pool was an easy one to say, you know what, we're going to close that up because it, 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 we're in a health pandemic and we can save money. Well, pools to me are an essential community development tool. And you know, if council thinks differently, I welcome the opportunity to hear from you um, on that. But I think that parks and rec pools and some of these other, uh, what seem as non-essential services are important that they're funded. Well, so that, you know, you're starting to explain from 2018 to 2021, we went from 317,000 to 533,000. That's the revenue. That's what you're budgeting to. And I'm just trying to understand, and this doesn't tell me yet where all the money's coming from, but it it it's more reflective of, you know, a pretty pretty large increase in a few years in a budget. And a similar thing happened in streets. And Josue, I, I want to say that I'm not asking these questions to challenge, but rather to just understand and also for community members who may be looking at this um, to understand. And, you know, I, for me, the entire conversation is somewhat shadowed by the uncertainty of our times. And so this isn't like your usual budget conversation. Um, when we did the budget for 2020, we, we had no idea what would happen. We now are going into this with some anticipation that the pandemic will continue to rage, perhaps even into next summer. So, you know, a lot of my concerns are just um, related to, to that and, and, um, insecurity about that. So just to give you context, it's not to say that I don't think that all these things are important or that they're in any way incorrect. I wanted to underscore that. Yeah, so I'm I, just worried. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in and say um, some really good issues, thoughts brought up. Um, so again, to me, this extends the idea that we need to better understand what right sizing our budgets mean and what these investments are about. And then kind of related to that, what I'm hearing Laura and Lisa both raise, which I think is important is, um, that it kind of almost ties back to uh, when Lisa talked about the vision um, on Monday. And so we need to understand, you know, it's not that, you know, these investments aren't a good thing, but like, what, what, what are we getting from that, right? And so as we look at these trends, um, and so I think we've had a good discussion about kind of the day-to-day -day piece. Mm -hmm. We need to understand like the future visionary piece. Um, and I think those are the ways that we'll, you know, be able to feel better about it. I think no one's gonna question that investing in health and well-being is important right now. So these kinds of areas that we're talking about is justified, so just, expanding that out a little bit yeah tell the story yeah and i appreciate that i appreciate that brian um and, and lisa uh, I, I, this, this is marianne i just want to weigh in on a couple things i have my screen off because in order to see the screen i have to like stick my nose into it almost and no one really wants to see me doing that i don't think um and I also want, wanted to acknowledge that I think this, we just need to understand. And when you see an increase of, well, like the Bryan Center right now, uh, $100,000 from 2018 to our current budget, it's good to maybe start off 
with that long, you know, those three, that three year period and say, you, you notice that it's increased a hundred thousand dollars. And this is the reason. So. Right. right. Thank and, you. and I'm sorry if I'm making assumptions about your, the context in which we are all coming to um, at this meeting, you know, because for me, I, I, I don't get to own the budget in 2017 or 2018. Uh, or even 2019, because those were all fair, very firm, uh, already formulated. So I have the context where I hear from my team and others about what is different from those years and what is different from now. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got limited context to that, and I try and I try my best to provide that context. One thing that is that is that I'm certain about that is different from say the spending levels in 2017 and 2018, and even going back many, many years prior to that is that we're doing a lot more work. We're getting a lot more done. So, so you know, the, putting that in a context, so Johnny just pointed out to me in, in operating supplies and streets, well, we're buying concrete, we're buying um, that uh, patching material for roads. You know, we're buying a lot of supplies because we're doing that house, that work in-house. Uh, so, and finally to that, I would say I'm not personally feeling challenged by the questions. I welcome the tough questions. I think that's part of the role is for me to make, uh, uh, be able to tell that story and be clear about what is it that we're doing. So I don't see your questionings as any way challenging uh, me or my administration and questioning what we're doing. I think it's the, when we need to have a conversation and we need to, we need to uh, talk through them. And I prefer that you ask the questions and ask the tough questions because that's how we're gonna to get to a common ground and a common understanding about what is it that the administration is trying to accomplish and what is it that, how we are looking to deliver on the council's vision and goals, which are formulated by public input, right? The, the councils are the individuals that carry the vision and mission of our residents. And that gets translated into the budget because that's how it gets executed. So I don't, I don't see it as a challenge or, or questioning um, or thinking about it. I, I look forward to the fruitful conversations and how we create value and we deliver the, deliver the best service that we, that we can to our residents with the limited resources that we have. But, but just so I understand the story, the story is we, are, we have these much bigger budgets because you're spending down reserves we've accumulated in past years. Yes, and that story, that story is in the context that we are doing more. The reason we've had these reserves saved up is because we've had people that have been uh, folks and team past teams, and I hate to throw anybody in the bus, we just didn't get work done. You know, we had simple things like maintenance lids and clean out traps and, you know, grinding concrete, uh, sorry, grinding sidewalks that just didn't get done. So yeah. if you increase in some of those expenditures, it's not that we're suddenly spending all this money, we're getting more work done. Yeah, and I appreciate I appreciate that, but lids and grinding it doesn't add up to these kind of dollars. I mean, and so it, it like Marianne said, you know, just I, well, my bigger concern is once you know, I think, and is it this year, Josue? If you get these budgets that you're proposing, we we will then have spent our reserves down up for the general fund to like nine hundred thousand. Is that right? Yes, but it, it, we would have spent, we have spent down less of it um, under my administration than what was projected in previous years. Well, I, I'm just wondering what the floor is, you know, is it, this is it. And so you won't be able to do that in future years. You're going to have to rewrite size your budget because you won't have reserves to draw on for these kind of, uh, you know, to, as, as you know, deferred maintenance kind of expenditures. Yes, that's correct. We're, we're um, based on the projection and the burn rate that we're looking at at the, the reserves, we're going to have a come to Jesus moment in about 12 months. Yeah. Thank you. But we knew that a year ago. All right. Well, I, we're thinking on the same lines then. That's that's what I see as well. Yep. And that's what, what our, the, the council then and, and, and the team here, we had a conversation a year ago when we were formulating the 2020 budget that we were getting pretty close to burning on, burning down our, our reserves and there were gonna be somewhat drastic changes uh, that would need to happen in 2022 and beyond. 
Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything? So I guess what I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was looking at Brian because, you know, Brian and I have had a lot of conversations about our reserves and right sizing and whatnot. And, and I think Brian, you were instrumental in right sizing, in the initial moves of right sizing the funds and, and you and Lisa with what we've done with the investment committee and the finance committee. So there are conversations that we've had about what does the future look like? Um, right. So I'm I sorry. guess what I'm thinking is philosophically, though, I just heard you say that a year from now, we're going to be at a point where we're at a crisis, right? And so for me, what I'm what I would like to keep front and center is what can we do now to both get done what needs to be done while mitigating the severity of an anticipated crisis in a year? rather than to drive full speed at that wall. And I don't, I just don't know where that happy medium is to, to somewhat mitigate an anticipated crisis, particularly in a pandemic year. Um, I, I just don't know. And I'm concerned about that. Yes, yeah, so and we don't all know the answers, but we know some of the answers. So when we talk about how do we, how do we, pull back on some of the improvement improvements that we're doing. The grant, what we've been doing with grant seeking is part of that strategy. We've been able to secure $1.7 million to execute on the active transportation plan. That is money that we don't have to dip into our reserves to accomplish improvement of crossing walks and sidewalks and lights. So for what we're doing to address that in the future is getting some of this grant money. So we got this 1.7 million. That means that those sidewalks uh, that are in bad shape along Dayton Street, we don't have to we don't have to spend on our reserves to get that fixed. We've got grant money coming in to do that. So we're, 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 we're anticipating some of those challenges in the future and working towards uh, securing grant money that would take the burden off from our citizens, take the burden off from our budgets uh, to create value and add value. What this does make me think about is maybe we need to run a few scenarios. Uh, I mean, for example, you know, we've been told that Cresco is going to go from 53 to or 57 to 93 jobs. Um, we're going to get some bump with property tax, even though that's not our main like driver. Um, so I think part of what I'm hearing is that maybe, you know, a way that we can get better context of you know, how we move forward is understanding what the future might look like. So, yeah. Um, but there are some positive things on the horizon. And I think that's another thing is that we can't just keep doing what the village has always done and like, you know, rely on reserves. We need to like make changes that are going to address the future. So, you know, I think that's, but you know, that balance, I, I think is a good thing that we're talking about. Utilities are huge in this. We have to address that. So, you know, we can't we can't like be snoozy like some of the past councils have been. Right, and you know, if I, I my most recently, right, we just had this potential annexation, and I I try to show the value of what uh, an annexation would do for us, and it helps address some of these some of these challenges. It helps create a larger tax base. So there's more people to spread around the cost and it can bring in additional revenue, both from a property tax and income tax. And that helps easing the burden on the current residents but also uh, bringing in additional revenue for us so that we are not in a crisis and in a year. We're certainly working with our partners, uh, sorry, with our business community to help bring jobs to the village. Uh, Brian and I were at a, we sat at a meeting to strategize about how we could help uh, some of our business uh, businesses improve their headcount and create additional revenue. And look where we are now, that, that, that one meeting paid off because one of those meetings we talked about Cresco, then Cresco just this year is able to add more than 20 jobs. And by next year, they're gonna be at over 90 jobs. And the income revenue of that is significant. It's gonna help our village. Uh, so we are, we are doing uh, a lot of that work behind the scenes. Well, Josue, I, one thing that, that concerns me, because you, you make the argument that 
annexation will bring tax revenue, we can't then turn around and give it away. CRA, ESID, these kind of tax abatement programs are giving it either plowing it back into the property and benefiting the developer or those individual property owners. We're get, you know, it's like we're going to turn around, give it away. So we can't say both, you know, we can't promote it as more tax revenue in real property taxes to us if we're going to have some sort of program where we're then turning around and giving it away. I, I think we can, we can promote both, Laura. And, and you're bringing in a conversation that others may not, may not have the privilege of having of conversations that we had at the housing advisory board where we said, hey, how do we, how do we incentivize and, and spur economic development and the, and the village? So what Laura mentioned is the concept of the CRA, a, a community reinvestment activity um, where you would encourage, promote development by either tax deferment or tax abatement. Now, currently, that's not at the table. Council hasn't, we haven't had that conversation um, about property tax abatement. We have had the conversation about an ESIT, about energy uh, special improvement district and how that can help promote economic development. And I think it's in the community's interest to use these economic development tools because without them, you, you can't have any development. So you need to invest in order to reap some of the reward to have a return on the investment. So we do get to say both because we have to invest and able to get a return. If we don't invest, we're not gonna see changes. <clears throat> so that's a whole bigger conversation about you're aware of things called cost of community services studies. And when you really look at all the inputs and outputs regarding development, usually the balance comes out that rooftops cost you money versus how much they bring in. Yes, and, but that's a bigger conversation. Yes, I'm familiar with that, with that, with those uh, ratios and that study that residential development are losers. That's what, what you're getting at, Laura, that they cost you more money. Rooftops cost you more money because of the service demand. I think that our community, we are facing a major challenge. We have folks that cannot afford to live in, in Yellow Springs. I have heard of people uh, leaving because they can't afford to live here. We've got a school system that has 190 children that are open enrollment because those families cannot afford to live in the village. So we have to do something different than what's been done going back to 1970s when we had when we adopted an anti-growth mentality. So the continuing the status quo isn't gonna, isn't gonna help our community thrive uh, and succeed. Well, there's a lot of assumptions in what you just said, Josue, but again, that's a topic for another conversation. Right, uh, yes, well, we, we can move on. So, so, we, so um, I like going kind of long, I appreciate at least I hear you, what you're saying. I really appreciate the line by line because that's, that's how my mind works, how I'm used to looking at budgets. I really want to understand each line. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree, Laura. I just think it helps to start with context mm -hmm. and then, yeah. then delve in so that everyone has the same level of understanding that you might have. Yeah. Okay, so we're about uh, we're close to an hour in. So how are we doing on special revenue? Um, I think, well, I need to, let me minimize this screen here and go back to our main screen. How are we, we've been talking about the, the up to 10,000 feet uh, view and we could start drilling down. We can go department by department. Um, and it starts, um, it starts with streets. It starts with streets. Um, the personnel expenses and the street department, as I mentioned earlier, we are trying to be cost sensitive and in right sizing those expenses. So you see a significant change uh, from the initial 2020 budget of having 266 in personnel uh, in 206 to 206. So that's, um, uh, we're working hard to make sure to ask what we need and do more with what we have. 
any any um, questions about up uh, the personnel and operating expense general operating expenses for streets those are you see major reductions there and uh, travel and training that remains the same I actually reduced that because I had two thousand oh you had two thousand yeah so some of the some of our streets uh, department we actually have uh, mandated certifications uh, that we need there and um, so it's important that we continue a high level or a, a considerable amount of uh, money for training. All right, then we move on to the streets. We have a lot of professional services. And Johnny, do you want to weigh in? That's the single largest expense in streets. Yeah, that includes your blacktop, your sidewalk repairs, your storm. Now everybody's got to understand all this storm that's coming out of here because we don't have an infrastructure for there. And that's a huge expense that we are uh, trying to do a lot of it ourselves, but some of it we can't do. So anything that we hire contractors for, uh, this is where some of the uh, services such as blacktop, cold patch, um, I'm trying to think right off the top of my head, a lot of the major expenses as professional services and, and we did not do as much blacktop as needed catch basins are we have brand new black streets because black was uh put down to make it look good uh prime examples if you go over behind Cahoe and uh miami and lisa and all that you'll see sinkholes in front of all the catch basins because they blacktop that street in 2000 and 15, but they didn't repair any of the catch basins. So therefore now you got sinkholes in front of all the catch basin because they was not repaired prior to the street going down. So we are got, uh, we've tested a company coming in. We actually got another contractor that's going to replace 10. And then the street crew is going to tackle. There's about 32 of them over in that area that we're going to repair and replace uh, so we can get them streets back to being what they should be. I'm not a fan of putting blacktop down just to make it look like you're doing something. <clears throat> I believe you ought to get it all fixed prior to putting the blacktop down. So when you're done, you're done. And this, and this year we did a lot, of, a lot, despite the cuts that we took due to COVID, Yes. We got a lot, a lot of alleys uh, repaired have, and uh, blacktop. Yes, the alley, the out. We we blacktop two alleys, one being behind uh, Dollar General. That alley was a mess, overgrown, uh, had some major potholes in it, and we also did the one between uh, Winter and uh, Walnut uh, that was being rutted up pretty bad and putting gravel back down on the wall as fast as we can put it in. The other changes that you see in the 2021 budget from our 2020 is, um, and the overall contractual expenses remain the same, but in 2020, we actually had to do a major cut because we were gonna have less revenue. And we, are def we have deferred some of the work, particularly in tree trimming. So for 2021, we need to we need to pick that pick up that work again. Um, so we're we're putting back uh, more money into tree trimming and line clearing. Can, <clears throat> let me go back to professional services. This year, we also did Walnut Street. If you guys notice, between uh, Dayton Street and uh, Short Street, uh, we actually did that when we brought in the contractor to look at it. The blacktop that had been installed so much that it was over the gutter plate, which was causing problems with the drainage on that roof. So we actually ground down three and a half inches of blacktop and only put back an inch and a half. So now the curb and gutters actually work like it should. So that is the challenges that we're facing. I, and I know that I have increased cost uh, because we expect to do more and, and get things back in order real fast. So uh, a lot of it is, I can just say, is from us doing more than what was done prior to the staff being here that's here now. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is streets. Um, 
on operating supplies. Do you want to talk about operating supplies? Well, operating supplies, there again, we're having to buy catch basin, storm piping. Uh, this is concrete. This is salt is in here too. Uh, salt is in operating supplies as well, uh, which uh, we split that between highway fund and this. So there is also salt included in that. This is anything that we need to be able to help. Uh, this is if the guys are doing cold patch, they can go get cold patch. They can get hot asphalt for utility cuts or whatever we need. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we've got fuel expense. Uh, we've been able to save money on fuel because fuel is being cheaper. Uh, and we hope that that remains true for 2021 to control the cost there. Uh, then the other things are tools. Tool, we, oftentimes we're just replacing tools. We're not buying new tools. We're replacing a lot of the, the tools that are, are getting old. Safety equipment, likewise, we... Um, well, one thing I would say that's about safety is if you remember I had, I had asked for uh, 12 AEDs and we actually, that was one of the things that we cut half of the budget out. So I had to put money back in for safety equipment this year to accommodate for the AEDs that I took out. Yeah. Now, that also, that doesn't mean that we didn't buy any, right? Because no, I bought six. And we got a grant. We got a grant. Uh, we applied for a public entity uh, pools grant, and we got they paid for one of them. They paid for one of them. So we were we were able to buy some, and hey, we're 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 getting money through grants. So um, we're doing we're doing well. All right, on capital. This is streets capital. We went initially. We had budgeted two hundred six thousand for capital. Uh, due to COVID, we, we slashed that down to 103, and for 2021, we are proposing to go up to one. To mm -hmm. one it's, it's changed, though. That's actually wrong. Oh, did because you, what I, changed? I changed it today. I added some stuff, so we'll talk about that later. Okay. Capital is a whole nother. Okay. This money, you see the expense here, and this money. These are transfers out. These are transfers that get put into the capital budgets. So they're not specifically broken out here. We have a specific capital uh, budget. Is it this one, Matt? No, it's on the same screen as what you were. It's just a different tab. Oh, for capital? This one? No. No, I thought we have a different screen. All of our capital budgets are broken out individually by project. Um, are you able to see my screen? So we, we're doing a five-year capital budget uh, planning, and we we put the money out as transfers, and then we allocate them or budget for them in this uh, line and this uh, spreadsheet. And this this conversation for capital, we'll have it on Monday. I'm uh, sorry, on Tuesday at 8.30 uh, in the morning. So first thing in the morning. So. 8.15, actually. 8.15. Judy, you providing coffee? Okay, and we have, uh, we, we do have the principal and interest payment here. This is gonna be the last, is the last year, right, Johnny? We got a, last year. We got a truck. That, uh, that in 2015, they bought a dump truck and they leased it. Leased to own. Yeah, so we did a lease to own. This is the last year we're going to have that expense on the uh, on the streets department. And um, uh, I don't think we'll, we need a large vehicle like that uh, for a while. So it's that expense. All right, that brings us to a total of Seven hundred and eighty-four thousand dollars. Sorry, seven hundred eighty-four thousand two hundred and nineteen dollars for the street department. How does that compare to previous year? Well, we're significantly lower than we were in the initial twenty twenty budget by uh, over a hundred thousand, and uh, slightly over on um, above on from twenty nineteen. Um, you may want to back up to the public works. But it's a lot bigger than 2018 
or 2019, right? Yes. I mean, that's kind of the story that's getting, which again, this is, I just want to understand it. It's because of, of uh, dipping into reserves and getting things done. Correct, correct. Okay, thanks. What were you saying? That 275, 600? Yes. This 275, what a big driver of this expense is $275,600. Um, we have a grant for Safe Routes to School that we needed to start allocating or incurring the expenses for the grant in 2020. We knew 2020 was a bad year, so we worked with ODOT and our partners to see if we could adjust the timeline and stage the work so that we didn't have to have such a large uh, cash outflow. And we've been successful at negotiating that. So we we're able to push off this expense of $275,000 for 2021. So that's uh, included in there. So now to Laura's point, you're seeing increases, but what also means we're doing more work. And I would say that this is a great investment because we're putting in um, 275,000 for a project that's significantly larger. And it's gonna replace sidewalks all the way from South, uh, from, uh, Dayton Street from, South. from Dayton Street to South Walnut. That's a big stretch of, of, um, of sidewalks that we couldn't do without this grant. And we can't get this grant money if we can't invest. 275 is the investment to get a return of over three times that amount. So we have to invest uh, to be able to do some of these improvements. All right, anything, uh, any questions on street fund? Okay. All right, now we move on to the, uh, the state highway fund. Uh, Johnny mentioned this earlier that some of the salt expense is shared with the state highway maintenance fund. And that's, that's that $10,000 expense you see here. For the state highway, we actually have dedicated revenues for that fund. And that comes in from uh, gasoline tax and uh, the motor vehicle license registration fees that we get. You'll see that this is a decrease from 2019. Uh, that's driven by two factors. One, there's less people driving and cheap uh, fuel, uh, fuel prices. All right, now on to parks and recreation. Parks and recreations. Here's our, our revenue sources. Uh, a lot of this is funded by uh, the transfers in that comes in from, from the general fund. Uh, but we do, we, we do get some pool admissions fees. We get rents, uh, some program receipts and uh, concessions. So we hope to be able to get back to uh, a normal operating year in 2021 when it comes to, to the pool and other park revenues. Now, as far as expenditures, I, I talked earlier about the pools on, uh, sorry, parks. Um, the wages are actually staying uh, are under control with some of the fringe benefits um, in those departments. There are things that, some things we don't, we don't have control over. We don't have control over the increase in healthcare, in healthcare uh, expenses and changes in family size of a workforce. Well, there are folks that get married or have kids and they take on additional health insurance coverage from us and that means we have to contribute a larger portion. So it's, it's part, of the, part of the doing business. So cost overall for wages or personnel services in, in parks is driven by those fringe benefits and not salaries. Travel and training, uh, there's budget in there. We actually reduce our budget, training budget from $2,500 to $1,100. Uh, part of that is because we're not back to normal business when it comes to training. So anything that we can do online, we're gonna seek those opportunities. On the non, uh, uh, the, these contractual expenses and other expenses, 
we try to maintain the same service level in those expenses, primarily because we have ongoing expenses that they just stay relatively the, the same. For example, the software licenses and hardware expenses, maintenance of facilities, vehicle maintenance. Uh, so those, those costs stay uh, pretty uh, consistent. So we try to keep in those around the same level. But overall, you're seeing a decrease in, um, in contractual services on the parks. And now we get into materials and supplies. Uh, we try to stay uh, close to what we, the spending levels that we've had. The increase here in, uh, in parks is the addition of safety equipment. All the other expenses have remained uh, uh, close to the historical expenditures. What's different in parks this year is we don't have this big expense in uh, capital. So we had it in 2019. It's come down in, in 20. It's, it's there again. You add it again? Yeah, it's on the capital budget. It's, it's not updated on this sheet. So when the uh, when we come back to capital, the, we're we're gonna get a do a deeper dive in the capital expenses. Uh, we have a full session on that with sheets that have been updated, uh, so that'll provide a better picture of what we're doing with capital. The uh, we don't have a vehicle expense there anymore, so you'll see that in 2017, but that's not an expense that that has carried over. All right, pool. You don't see any wages in pools, and that's because our our um, uh, wages for our pools, I'm uh, sorry, our Rex manager actually comes out of the, the John Bryan Center, and the only wages or personnel expenses we cover in the pool are the uh, part-time wages. So part-time wages and the pension contribution for those wages, workers' comp is something we pay for everyone, uh, uniforms, Medicare contributions, and these physical spheres are a drug test. All, everyone who works at the pool is tested for, for drug use. So that's our overall expense. The increase we've seen here is um, in the part-time wages. The, this year was an exceptional year. We had to hire uh, gate attendants to take temperature for gate attendants. Uh, we were fortunate that we could use the CARES Act funds to offset that, uh, but we want to we wanna be proactive and include wages for part-time uh, wages for the pool because we're not sure what it looks like, so we want to plan ahead. Also, I think the I, I, one of the things, I don't know if you heard me say this, but a lot of our parks and recs, uh, particularly the pool department, um, it, it operates sort of a, a workforce development program. We, we hire a lot of our local youth and we train them and we give them world, world, real work experience uh, in, in providing services. And I think they do a great job. I don't think we could have gotten through the pool season if not for the committed young people uh, of our community to work at the pool as lifeguards, as gate attendants and general maintenance staff. So it's what, how I see some of the contributions here is we're investing in our young people. All right, so that's the pool. The pools, uh, other expenses, we, they do go up and down a bit uh, depending on what's breaking. Uh, and I say that because last year, as we get, we get, we're all excited about opening the pool and boom, our water heater just blew out. So, and the electric panel in the uh, baby pool. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, but those expenses for contractual services, uh, we're projecting them in that $25,000. And that's close to where it was in 2018 In 2019. The exception was 2014 that they were about uh, $10,000 less. And these are actual expenses. Okay. All right, materials and supplies, costs uh, relatively similar from 
the 2019, and these are just uh, historical numbers. We're spending about that much. Here's the big ticket items is repainting of the pool and doing some trip hazard repairs. So that brings us to a total of 137,000. And that increase in the budget is driven by these capital expenditures. Any questions on pool? Okay. The Bryan Center. You're gonna see significant increases here in the salaries and that's due just properly allocating staff. Uh, so we've shifted some of those expenses where we, we, we think is best to put them in. Uh, so that's driving a lot of this increase from 134 to 156. Um, previous years, 2018 and 2019, those are pretty uh, consistent. They're similar expenditures. So that's what's driving this change this year. Moving down to contractual services, we see an increase in the uh, professional services. For 2020, the John Bryan Center, we're having a challenge with our water, our water heating system. We have a boiler system at the John Bryan Center and the hardness of our water has created a circulation issue where it, uh, the scaling has burned out some of our boilers. So we're gonna do uh, some unique engineering to our system where we're gonna create its own closed water loop system and it's gonna have uh, softened water, especially treated water, um, so that it doesn't have hardness built up and low water boilers. So that's the change that, it's, uh, that we're putting in the professional services. But in previous years, you see that Uh, so that's uh, these other expenses you see here, electric, water, these are utility expenses. So they're high. Um, and that's what it costs to uh, heat the building, provide water to the building and the sewer service for the building. You may be wondering why we have these expenses when we are owner utilities. Well, we have to put the expense in the right department. So um, these expenses, we pay them out of the department and they get paid to the municipal enterprises. And those municipal enterprises are their own self-sustaining businesses and they have to remain that way. And so they have to charge uh, for the services uh, no matter who it is or what department it is, so. Okay, all right, that's for contractual service. Last one on there is natural gas. We do have gas um, uh, equipment. Um, we've got what, our, our boiler and what else do we have? The water, water heater. The water heater. So both the water heater and the, and the, and the boiler system is gas operated. Office supplies, operating supplies remain consistent. What's new this year from uh, the John Bryan centers, we don't have a big capital outlay. <laughs> just, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to get and have a deeper conversation about um, the capital on Tuesday at 8.15. I'll be well caffeinated that day. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. The, the, the Brian Youth Center. Brian Youth Center, what we, what, what the expenses you see there are primarily supplies. We've got the, the other personnel expenses and other line items. Uh, so we break out that, that department on its own but primarily just for supplies. Okay. All right, ready for the economic development fund. We, um, on revenues, we, we're, if we're having any particular activities that we need to, we need to add them into the, um, uh, Economic Development Fund, we expect any additional uh, activities. For 2019, we used up the, the funds that we had designated for the revolving loan fund. Um, what's sitting in there for this year is the, the, the $15,000 that we received from the Green County. Um, we received a grant and what we're, we're 
going to do with the ground is we have an issue at the at Ellis Pond. We've got a lot of algae that's overgrown in the and the Ellis Pond. And one of what's causing the issue is we were having low rains and low flow in that and we start water recirculation at that pond. So Johnny and the engineering team have worked come up with a creative system of putting an irrigation system um, in the Ellis Pond that would help put oxygen in the water and that would help keep algae down and other things. Johnny, you wanna it, talk it, it would require three year uh, aeration systems that we can time to run during the day and not at night time. Uh, but it will allow the water that's sitting in there not going anywhere to recirculate to keep the algae down and make it a better place to go out and socialize. Uh, one time it was almost algae all the way across. It has got a little bit better with the rain that we've got, but it's still got some better. So for expenditures, we're anticipating 50,000 and that's what we put in here. And so certainly open for discussion because this has been primarily a, 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 a activity driven by council mission, vision and goals. What's different from last year's allocation is the $60,000 that we, we um, made to Home Inc. That doesn't carry it over into 2021, but the other expenses, 30,000 and 20,000 for uh, membership fees for certain program activities uh, is included. So, and that fifteen thousand you mentioned is that reflected here? No, because that we haven't. Um, we we think that we're going to get it for next year, but we don't have a guarantee that we are going to get it. Okay. So, we're we did get this grant this just recently in a, a couple weeks ago. So we we're. Bye, Denise. Good to see you, so for that fifteen thousand, we we want to spend it this year. We want to spend this year. We feel pretty confident that we're going to get another fifteen thousand dollar grant for next year. So do we want to have that allocation in this economic development fund? Um, probably. And then this fifty thousand. This is just this is a number with no, no projects attached to it. Correct. All right, so I think it's just gonna be important uh, council members to think about um, this economic development fund. And uh, and obviously that's you know, part of a future discussion, but uh, I think it would be important to figure out uh, if in fact we are gonna you know, put some activity towards this, which I think we should. All right, Green Space Fund. I have a couple questions. What's professional services line 53104? Line 53104. So for which which fund, uh, Laura? 205 So this is for the economic development fund. It's, it's been the catch, the account where we put the uh, revolving loan fund. This is where, where that money was in there. So that's the line. The, the, that fund was created with these three line items. So unlike some of the other, some of the other funds say, you took the youth center, you, these were created with, uh, with a lot more uh, expense accounts. The economic development fund was created with only these three expense accounts. Uh, sorry, these four expense accounts. If we want something else, we could certainly add more expense accounts or we can, um, move money around to reflect what the actual work is going to be. But things in here would be economic development fund or general expenses. There wouldn't be things like vehicle maintenance or some of the other things because they wouldn't apply to an economic development. So, so right now, so we don't have $20,000 worth of memberships. So, so we really have something like 40, Eight thousand to think about spending on something. So the this membership expense in twenty nineteen, um, the twenty nineteen was a budget was already created when I when I joined the team. This allocation was the contribution for the Yellow Springs Development Corporation, and that was intentionally put in that way. So that was 
us as a member of the development corporation, this was our contribution to get that work going. And so, and so that's in the 20,000 that's budgeted, a big chunk of that, it's, it's like an annual contribution to the development corporation. Correct. Okay, and the 30,000 is, it's just a placeholder for whatever economic development activity we might think of. Correct. Okay, thank you. And then the other thing is, you know, it has been on my mind, um, one of the things that uh, Megan highlighted in her, uh, you know, saying the vote for the levy, which was that there was originally some intention around investing in economic development. So I, I do think it's important for us to really think about this piece and ideally attach some ideas to it um, when we start talking about budget, budget at the council meeting. All right, green space fund. Uh, no revenue in green space and no expenses in, in green space. Uh, do we anticipate needing to make a contribution to the Jacoby uh, partnership or any other green space related activity? We should anticipate that. Um, and you know, my understanding is that there is activity happening. Um, so it would probably be good to get with Krista or Michelle to figure out you know, what they're expecting. Okay. Because I believe, I think next year is the last year for those funds because they had like three years to spend them, I think. Okay. And then uh, if, if, the, if that sunsets, do we reabsorb it back into the general fund? Yes. Okay. Just a minute. Oh, wait. Sorry. Yeah, maybe. I'll... I, I do not think that we would. I, I think if we don't spend it on the Jacoby, we would keep it in the green space fund. Yeah, I, I, I think I spoke too quickly. So the green space fund, I mean, those funds will stay there, um, but we will no longer have that 200,000 commitment um, that we have right now. So, okay. Okay, we'll follow up with Krista. Okay, this is, uh, we have a, a uh, motor vehicle license permissible tax fund, but that's where revenue comes in and no expenses. Mayor's core computer funds, $1,000, primarily funded by fines and uh, Mayor's court fines. And it goes, it's dedicated to computer and hardware expenses. So Sway, in the interest of time, anything under 10,000, I don't need to see or hear about really. I don't know about anyone else. Agreed. Okay, all right. That makes it easy for So we'll skip over coats and supplies. We'll skip over this one. Uh, that's under 5,000. Clifton doesn't have anything. Utility Roundup is under 10,000. So police pension, police pension is unique because uh, we do get an inside millage that is specifically for the police pension fund. And that uh, is part of the property tax revenues that we get. Uh, so that's that 38,000. And then we transfer in money from the, from the, um, the general fund. So this number, you know, this is dependent on what wages, what wages uh, the police officers make everything that's pensionable. So that number varies a little bit, but that's, that's where we allocate that police pension um, uh, revenue and then the expense that's associated with it. We do cover some of our accounting, uh, sorry, auditor fees in there. We do allocate a small portion of that expense because our auditors have to audit that fund like they do all the other ones. Uh, so we've got, it, um, we've got a little expense in there. Guarantee deposits, that's it. So here we are with the revenues. Total revenues is 1.4 and the special revenue fund expenses is 1.5. It does look like a deficit. We are drawing down from reserves. And that covers our, our uh, special revenue funds. Okay, and then one thing, this number is gonna change after capital budget, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Brian, we 
got six minutes to spare. No, you just got enterprise. No, enterprise. <laughs> yeah. You got six minutes to do three major enterprises. No, we're going until 7 30. So you got you got an hour and four minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. 34 minutes. Oh, yeah, 34 minutes. Right. <laughs> enterprise funds. Enterprise funds. All right. Well, we were talking about enterprise funds earlier today. You know what drives this? Um, we have to keep these uh, uh, these enterprise uh, enterprises uh, self sustaining. So we were we we come through this one and make sure that we are keeping operating expenses in line with the revenues that are coming in. So we'll start up at the top. Similar to the special revenue funds, we look at each fund and we look at the total revenue, look at the expenditure, and we do that by fund. So starting up at the top, electric. We anticipate uh, $4,216. Josue, uh, are you, Josue, are you intending to share a screen? Thank you, thank you, Kevin. I'm, I'm just going at it without realizing that, uh, <laughs> that uh, I'm not sharing my screen. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. I'm sorry, what was that? So that's oh. Johnny's asking me to unhide a column here. No, unhide. Oh, that's a lot of columns to unhide. A lot of columns. Right, we'll see you again. Yeah, let me let me hide a bunch of these. We we're tracking all these expenses going back several years. So we'll go back to 2017. That work? That's fine. Okay. Actually, that's even. We got two. Okay. All right. So here we are for 2021. We're staying in line with the revenues, I and mean, we're we're gonna make we're gonna make one dollar uh, in profits here. Um, Good. So and we're we're and reason for that is, you know, we've had initially set this minimum reserve of uh, 1.2 million dollars. So. We're, we're gonna stay on track to make sure that we are not exceeding our expenses because we reached that, uh, that minimum reserve level. So anything that we're not gonna exceed our expenditures there. So that's what you see there. On water fund, we, we are doing better than the minimum reserve. We're bringing, we expect to bring in $1.2 million uh, in the water fund and we're gonna limit our expenses to $923,000. So that will yield some additional money for us. The on the sewer fund, we expect 1.1 million, well, 1 million 187,000, and we anticipate expenses around uh, 1 million 43,025 dollars. So we're gonna generate some income. Um, I have a question about the sewer fund. What is in Included in capital uh, expenses or improvements, and what wouldn't be? I mean, is any relining of the sewer is that capital? Yes. You want to talk about any anything like sewer relining, uh, cameraing of all the sewer lines, uh, putting in new manholes and stuff like that, Marianne, is capital improvements. Rerouting sewers. Okay. Does that help you? Yes. I, I have a question about the electric reserve. So back in the day, uh, it was much bigger and people would ask about, it was like, I don't know, I'm trying to remember 2.5, 2.7 million. And, and we occasionally people would say, well, why is it that big? And my answer was always, we own our electric grid and we're not insured. Those poles aren't insured. So if we get a tornado that takes out big part of the grid, guess what? We go into the reserves. That's correct. Okay, so this is, makes me think this, this reserve amount minimum of 1.2, it seems a little scary to me. Uh, which, is, which is why we are not spending more than we're bringing in. But yeah, there's I'm, We've moved, yeah. we've moved a substantial amount to the capital fund mm -hmm. for Correct. electric. So that was part of the right sizing was to get it out of this fund and into capital. But it's sitting in capital as a capital reserve. 
It's it it's not. I wouldn't say that it's sitting in capital reserves. It is what it would. we do have a balance in the electric fund capital reserves, but we are making improvements to the system on a regular basis. So, I'll give you an example of of uh, what that capital improvement looks like. Just uh, about a month ago, we identified the forty poles that we are going to replace over the next uh, twelve to twelve to sixteen months. So that's forty poles. It, it just in supplies, I think we're looking at close to $200,000 uh, to replace poles. So that, that money is coming out of the, out of the uh, capital reserve fund. So well, I mean, so this one I'm saying, so then a tornado comes through and takes out those brand new poles, we don't have anything to replace them with. I mean, that, that's the point of having that big reserve in electric. Right, and we have, and we have those money, right? So if, if a tornado does come through and knocks out 40 poles, well, we got money for 40 pole replacements in that fund, and we can get those poles up and running. So you th you're comfortable with this target of 1.2 million? I, I would say that I have to get really good at risk management and mitigation, and I have to be prepared for the worst case and to be able to execute with the limited resources that we have. And with that, I can say I'm comfortable that if we had a tornado come through, we have resources to be able to get us up and running, and we got mutual aid agreements that could pitch in. And if we need additional resources, well, we've, uh, we've got the relationships, we know the resources that are available that can assist us in getting our community back up and running when it comes to power. Yeah, but they won't pay for polls. They may send you manpower, right? Yes, but if you if we draw from recent experience of tornadoes that hit Ohio, you know, FEMA makes money available. So we've got the expertise in house that we can act on those resources. So if a tornado came and hit Yellow Springs, we're not going to be out on our own. You know, I think that there are there are state resources that we will be able to tap into. So that's part of the risk mitigation aspect of our work is that you know we, we there are catastrophic events that could happen and we have uh, some resources to be able to act immediately uh, up, upon them. And then we've got those uh, secondary and treasury resources that we can tap into, uh, but we have to know how we would utilize them and who do we act on. The benefit of having the AMP community is that the AMP community as an organization makes resources available to help its members uh, deal with catastrophic events. Oh, well, that's and always been true. I'm just saying you're, you're, you're managing it different than other village managers have managed that fund. You're managing it at a much lower level, counting on external help. Well, I'm working. I mean, I'm just making an observation. I mean, you, you know. Yes, and, and I would say that we have gotten pretty good at managing with, uh, with these numbers that we have. I don't, I, I, two things. I'm working with what I have, one. Two, with what I have, I'm comfortable, comfortable and confident that we were able to deliver the, what our community needs. I think we've proven that just a couple months ago, we had somebody knock two poles out and knock significant power out. We were getting people up and running uh, within an hour. So, Johnny, were you gonna say something? Yeah, we, I believe we changed that to capital. We put money in the capital budget because it was because we had so much sitting there, right. uh, they was wanting to reduce rates and this and that, which would have until hurt the capital budgets because then we wouldn't have money to be able to do it. We are, we're making changes every day. Laura, I've been through three or four tornadoes and, and worked very many power line problems because of it. And I fully understand what you're meaning by a large uh, money in that pot, but two million versus one million is not a bunch when you're talking about the whole entire electric grid system. So I'd rather be proactive versus reactive right. and change stuff daily and and have that minimum reserve sitting there to where if we do need to uh, spend it all at one time, we can get it out of there. And this is what we have in, in, in uh, reserves and electric capital. We have 1.4 million as of last week that we ran this report. That's on, on the electric capital. On the electric operating fund, this is how much cash we have uh, right now. 
So I think, uh, uh, yeah, I appreciate the observation and good discussion. Two things I think we need to, you know, think about, and we can talk about this more at the council meeting. One is what Johnny said about being proactive versus reactive. The more we invest in our system, the more resilient it's going to be. Correct. And then the second thing is, I mean, we made a conscious decision several years ago that we weren't just going to keep those funds sitting there because as you pointed out, Laura, people have always asked, why is it there? I mean, it, it, my, I feel strongly that, uh, you know, kind of along the lines of we need to invest current taxpayer dollars on, you know, projects that are happening that benefit them. Um, but I think this is a good thing to like look at because um, it relates to policy and philosophy on that. Um, but I, I will say, and I've said this before, I feel strongly that we shouldn't just be sitting on money and not doing anything with it. Correct, correct. Well, it's like an insurance reserve. I right. mean, if you're self-insured, you have insurance reserves. And so it's what level do you think uh, it needs to be set at? I'm co very comfortable with the explanation that Josue and Johnny have both given, and I would like to move on. Thank you, ma'am. All right, on water fund, we're expecting uh, $1,222,200. We're limiting our expenses to $923. Um, we're above the minimum reserve that was previously established. So that's, uh, that's a comfortable position to be in, almost uh, half a million dollars. Sewer fund, likewise, we're at 1.1, uh, sorry, we're 1,187,000, limit our expenses to 1,043,000. Uh, so that's slightly above our minimum reserve. Solid waste fund, this is our trash service. As you know from the past, this is really a pass through. So we expect uh, 292,000 in revenues and expect, anticipate 290 um, expenditures. So that would, uh, Net, we'll have a net income of two thousand dollars, so we'll still carry a, a healthy a healthy balance in that account, um, and that's our overall revenues for enterprises six million nine hundred and seventeen thousand eight hundred dollars, and ex and expenses totaling six million four hundred and seventy two thousand six hundred and forty four dollars for a net income of four hundred and forty five thousand one hundred and fifty six dollars. So now we'll, we'll dig deeper. Uh, revenues for the electric fund, this is primarily funded for, from uh, consumer fees, what we charge people for the electricity. We sell them. Uh, turn on fees and tap fees uh, are a component of that revenue stream, and we're looking at 4205000 Then we've got a couple additional fees that we generate a small amount of money on. Uh, pole rentals, we do get paid for other uh, utilities running on our poles. Uh, we get about $10,000. The actuals for 2019 were nine, $9,884. So we run that up to 10,000. Then other fees we get are um, check fees, scrap metal. And uh, we're, we're, we're being very optimistic. We're gonna get $100 from car chargers donations. <laughs> Yeah. So that brings a total yeah, revenue. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who said budgeting can't be fun? <laughs> uh, funny. Uh, so we anticipate four million two hundred and sixteen thousand one hundred dollars. Our wages, our wages have, have remained pretty uh, uh, consistent. We have done some uh, reallocation, and you know I mentioned in the previous meeting that I I'm allocating some of my expense and uh, the electric fund. Uh, so that's moved up to uh, 321. All other expenses are related to how we manage uh, the allocation of expenses, of the uh, fringe benefits. Uh, most expenses have remained the same. So overall, we're seeing a reduction in personnel expenses and electric. Uh, operating expenses, sorry, travel and training remains remain the same. We, we, I feel fortunate that we get a lot of, uh, a lot of training uh, free. I was able to get my power certification. I don't know if you all knew, but I'm certified uh, public power administrator now. So, oh. yes. <laughs> so, 
um, Johnny sent me the certificate before I even before I even got it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got some training and uh, training dollars in there. All right, and these are expenses. The single largest expense we have is power cost. Power cost is estimated at three point two million dollars for the year, and this is directly from AMP. We received that um, uh, a couple of days ago, actually. So this number is freshly updated. And we have those statements somewhere in our, in our SharePoint. Um, so that's our single largest expense. All other expenses remain relatively the same. Uh, Josue, Josue do, those, do those costs go down? I mean, are we on a downward trend in what the, what the annual cost is? We are not. Let me see, where did we pull those? Do you guys remember we put those uh, AMP projections? I'll have to, we do have a, do you want to look it up, Johnny, yeah. while I talk and maybe we'll, I know it's in SharePoint. So uh, we have, we, we can calculate a lot of our power costs over the years because we have contracts um, with certain energy providers. So we've got the Brownfield, we've got a couple of amp hydro projects, we got our solar farm. So a lot of those projects, they are long-term uh, PPA contracts, so PPA or power purchase agreements that we have agreed to buy a set amount of power at a fixed price over an extended year, uh, period of time. So over 70% of our energy is coming from those contracts and that's renewable energy. What we buy above that is what's in the, in the open market. And we're buying what we can buy from the open market without a contract obligation. This year, we've been buying a lot, a lot of that energy is coming from uh, gas producers because that is the, the cheaper energy. Uh, so how does it affect on price? In 2021, one of our contracts is going to expire. One of our wind projects is expiring. And so we're thinking about how to, what are we going to do with that contract expiring? Um, we're either thinking about a similar replacement project or we're talking about investing in one of our own projects. Community Solar has been a project um, that we've been talking about in the community, the community wants to see it. So we've explored, we're exploring several energy projects, um, some that could be built within the, within the area, say our Sun Farm, we've got, um, we've got over 20 acres there in the farm and we can build a four megawatt system. So we're looking at that. and. You know, this is not, uh, I'm not saying that this is going to get built, um, but part of my job as the, the, the village manager is to be proactive and think about what is possible. So I, I hope that people don't walk away from here that thinking we're building a four megawatt solar farm at, uh, at the farm right now. So getting back to your question, do we know the projections over the years? Yes. We do, we do know how our energy contracts are changing over time and what is the blender rate? How do all those contracts when combined have an impact on our power cost? So we, we do see a drop next, do we see a drop next? I think it's an increase next it's year. It's an increase in increase. Johnny is looking for that, uh, let me see if I find it in here. Uh, Maybe we put it in public works. Oh, okay. Oh, I should look at exit this. You know, we we put together the SharePoint so that we could find um, all these documents much easier. And and it was not my intention to derail the conversation. Uh, but just to have an understanding of what, what the future is going to look like. And uh, to the previous point you were making about, you know, the one contract expiring, it's making decisions about what, what's next. Right, right. Well, yeah, we're thinking about what projects we could execute. Um, is it this one? Okay. All right. So this is a 2020 plan. This is our energy usage, member usage. Uh, effective energy rates. There's one specific to the village. Uh, 
da televizije. Da, Yeah, I know. I thought I thought we put it in. Um, All right, we well, got about fourteen minutes, so keep looking. All right, keep looking. Jenna, we keep looking. I'll get back to your question, um, Kevin. I will. I will forward the council the projection of the average power cost for the village over the next five years because we have that projection, and that's part of the planning tools that we use to anticipate um, energy prices and how to make informed decision about projects and investment in projects. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, but overall, we're seeing a decrease in our utility contractual services for the electric fund from 3.7 million down to 3.5. So, and that's primarily because of the cost of natural gas power. Correct, so you look at our power cost yeah. going from 3.6 million that we spent in right. 2008 down to 2009 and 3.2 for 2021. So we are we are able to reduce that power cost by buying energy off the market. So that's um, that's helping out our finances. So that allows us to also reduce some um, materials and supply expenses. And there you go. That's the overall picture. Big savings going from five point. Uh, 6 million down to 5 million down to 4.2 million in total electricity expenses. It'd be nice if we could tell people we're going to reduce their electric rates, but I know that that can't happen. So it's you know, a bigger conversation. It is, it is. And 2020 is, I don't know if anybody could have pictured 2020. We've got a recession, recession. we got cheap energy prices, which if we go based on, on previous recessions, the last recession in 2008, 2009, is when the gas companies made a ton of money. They had record-breaking profit margins. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an odd year. We, don't, we, we also see the other effect that we're seeing, Laura, in energy prices is, We've got the first energy debacle that happened in Ohio. We had a legislator that was in cahoots with creating a, creating a package for Energy First to give them a ton of money, and that had a ton of impact on energy prices um, all around. Uh, for us, you know, it, it devalued our renewable energy credits because HB6 removed a lot of the renewable energy uh, requirements for, for public activities. So, but to Laura's point, to Laura's point, um, that's been something that the uh, the idea that we could possibly reduce electoral costs for community members has been something that I've wondered about, and previous administrations um, were like, nope, absolutely not. That can't possibly happen. Utility consultants were brought in and said, nope, nope, it absolutely can't happen. But, you know, I know that it's important to sometimes ask the same question over and over again because times change. And so, you know, I do think that's something that we should continue to ask ourselves because it is such a dissatisfier for community members. And we, we have to try if we can. Yes, and we are. I know it's not with electric, our electric rates is perhaps the most competitive of all of the utility rates. What Johnny and I are focused on is, is working on water rates because that's among the highest. And so we're, we're working on that. Um, we're putting meters on properties that didn't have meters. We're addressing water losses um, when we can find them. And so we think that by reducing our overall cost we're gonna be able to deliver better value for our residents. Now, what's happening for 2021, um, internally and with some members of council, I've had a conversation about the water rates expiring in 2020. So we're not, we're not coming to council with a proposed water rate increase because we understand the difficulty or the challenges around the rates. So what, what we're focused on is, okay, how do we continue to deliver the services that we're delivering and even better without that additional uh, rate increase on, 
on the U water utility. So that's a way that we're addressing that question, uh, Lisa. Uh, maybe it's not, doesn't sound like a reducing rate, but slowing the rate of, of rate increases is in a way addressing that. Fair, I do think going forward in 2021, um, there, there should be some council people focused on, on this particular issue. It's, it's math. It's the expenses particularly, and I don't, I don't know where you have the plant costs, Josue, maybe it's below, but. Plant cost is right down here. We've got several. Yeah. We have, we, we tallied them all up. We have seven loans. Yep. Yep. There it is. Divide it by the service addresses. It's math. But you know, I can't. I can't do anything about those loans. We're we're we did the math. Uh, Matt and I, I know. working on the amortization schedule uh, for the for the for the debts, and our five million dollar loan is uh, the amortization schedule is out to twenty forty three. Yeah. You know, I, my basic math. I'm looking at twenty twenty. Add twenty three years to that. Oh, I know. Uh, I'm still back on electric too, though. I mean, so and not. It, it's getting late. I'll I'll stop bringing up strategic things. Okay. I, I thought we were done electric. Anything else we need to cover in electric? Nope. Okay. All right. Water fund. Those are the revenues for the water fund. I, most of it is consumer fees. The expenses. We're managing costs. Wages are, are slightly are slightly down. Um, overall costs. We actually are are are, are cutting costs in personnel uh, services. Training dollars, we we reduced it. Johnny Johnny thinks he can do with a thousand dollars in training in there, so uh, we reduced that from four thousand. Uh, here, are the general contractor uh, services expenses; those have remained in line, very predictable. So we'll we'll leave them as they are. Likewise, for materials and supplies, no uh, capital improvement projects. Uh, we'll get to it. We'll cover this in. in, in detailed and here are debt services. These are the loans that, um, that we're talking about. And the numbers for debt service, we have uh, confirmed those. Okay, um, we did remove some transfers out of there. Um, and we removed the transfer of 150,000 as it would cost depletion of our reserves. So we were sensitive to that. So that's, we cut that cost. We don't wanna dig too, too uh, too deep into our minimum reserves. So there we go, water distribution expenses. All right, now water treatment. Remains the same for 2020, 2021, 2020, 2021 expenses. So uh, training, 2,500. The con uh, contractual services remains the same. The materials and supplies, little increase, um, cost of chemicals has gone up. So that's been adjusted to reflect the cost of chemicals for water treatment. And the expenses, these didn't carry over. We were, we were calculating these earlier and um, uh, this is the amortization schedule that we were working on. So those expenses, are these your numbers? Uh, not, they need to keep them they know, Okay. So we're, we're, we're looking at, um, I think the numbers are gonna be the same, about $330,000 of, of uh, a debt. So let me just copy that for a placeholder there. Uh, I thought we had that at this time. So this is what Laura was talking about from the water treatment, that water plant. It is, um, it is a sizable expense. So Josue, if you subtract the debt service, what are all the other costs for the water plant, like to run the water department? What is the... the What's the total budget less the debt service? Yeah, well, it's um, the, call, the main driver's personnel expenses as it is in most of our budgets. That's 202,000. Then we've got, um, we've got 89,000 in contractual services, which supplies, materials, professional services, insurance, maintenance of equipment. Then we've got the materials and supplies 
these are specific, but what's driving here is the actual chemicals that we use at the plant to treat the water, water softener, removing metal. What else do we buy, John, chemicals? Caustic. Caustic. Yeah, it looks like um, about $880,000. Actually, you removed the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we could do the well, quick, we could do the quick math right here, right? So let's so let's that's say that's let's eight. say that this is going to be equal the total. You want just water treatment or, or both yeah, water treatment and distribution, yeah. Laura? Just water treat water treatment because water, yeah. water water treatment is seven eleven, uh, and you subtract the three three, 330. three thirty. That comes out to three eighty one. Three eighty one. So I know this is a radical idea, but if the cost of, bulk, of if we got a grant to do the water line to Springfield and we bought bulk water and we still made the debt service, I'm guessing we would save a hundred or 200,000 a year. I'm just saying. And that's the sad thing about the math is that you could literally put a padlock on that water plant, buy bulk water from Springfield and come out cheaper probably. I think that this is a conversation that should not be happening. If you wanna do that offline, okay. Well, but, I but, but it's not happening right now. The community wanted a water plant. There is no more important resource for our community than water and this, Let's just not go there right now. If you want to bring that up in some other category, go for it. But it's well, not you want, the, right the question now. on the floor was, how do you save money on water costs? And I just told you. Now you have a different view. That's fine. We, we do not know what the cost would be to run a line to Springfield whose water potentially can be contaminated by the Tremont spill underground. This or is our, not appropriate to be doing right now. Or, well, ours has danger from a couple of sources, Marianne. So I'm just saying. On sewer fund, we uh, we have uh, we expect consumer fees of one million one hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars, and tap fees of eight thousand dollars. Those are our revenue projections, and they're aligned with uh, with this uh, historical numbers and. Um, in 2019, we, in 2019, we received about the same amount. So we're going back to that number for uh, sewer service. There are expenditures. Expenditures are holding pretty steady. We actually see a reduction in personnel services, reduction in training expenses. Uh, our contractual services remain the same. And again, these are these are operations that are very mature and and the expenses stay uh, somewhat consistent. So on the transfers out, we did do a reduction of transfers out. That's uh, in order to uh, maintain the minimum reserves in this operating fund. So there's our overall expense. Now we go to sewer treatment. Um, personnel expenses are holding steady. Training, we, we this we do need to invest in, uh, in the sewer treatment trainings at a higher amount. There are licensings that need to be maintained. Uh, this is primarily driven by the EPA requirements of uh, uh, sewer treatment. All right, so this is um, contractual expenses. We do see an increase in the electric uh, expenses we anticipate uh, that uh, increase and Johnny, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, what that is, is for the last three years, and I don't know why, but the, they was always paying September, October, November, and December's bills and January. So to get us back to normal, we need to put $130,000 in that account so we can have a normal $85,000 budget versus keep dragging that on it at one back four years and that's the way that it's always been done. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I want to get it to where we're paying 21 bills and 21 versus keep carrying it over. Yeah. So I asked to increase that to 130 just to get us back to the normal. So the increase will be one time. It'll be one time and then the next year's budget will be that that 12 months. 
I think we've seen the same thing in an electric, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of years back. Yeah. Yep. So, we did see that last year in uh, solid waste as well. We were we were sort of playing catch up and carrying right. over right. Uh, expenses. So it is after seven thirty. Okay, I think I think That's this it. this is it. This is the last Other one. Than so, the sewer of transfer. so then we did reduce transfers out of the sewer treatment. Again, we want to stay in in line with the the uh, reserves for this fund. So there we are. And uh, anything on energy projections? No, I can't find it. I okay. don't think you put it on there. Okay. Kevin, to go back to the energy production, I think it's an added cost next year, and then it goes down after that on energy cost. That, that sounds good. Um, but yeah, if we still could get that you know, projection over the long haul, it, was, it might be helpful. Just if for nothing more than information say, but thank you. I appreciate what you, what you guys are doing. Okay, any other questions or comments before we wrap it up? All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Take care guys, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.